Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you on behalf of AHDB to the third and final of our Milling Wheat Week webinars. Welcome back if you have been with us for the previous webinars, but if you missed those, you'd like to catch up with them, you can do that on the recordings that have been made for um, both of the previous events and will be for this one. Well, today it's the Yen Quality Awards, but just before we begin, just need to run through a few bits of housekeeping. Um, apologies if you've heard all this before, it, it is important information though. You are all muted. Um, we're due to finish approximately two o'clock. As I said a few minutes ago, the webinar will be recorded so you can view it afterwards. You can ask questions, well, we hope you will. Um, use the question tab, please, on the right-hand side of your screen in that grey list you should be able to find. You can use that throughout the webinar to type your questions in. CPD points, basis and neuroso, that is, are available for the webinar. Please could you download the form from the handout tab. It's somewhere near where the question tab is in that list and sign it and return it to the events email address. That's events at ahdb.org.uk. Or um, there'll be a form sent to you after the event, which you can use uh, instead. And now to introduce our chair for the session today. We'll also be presenting the awards, virtually that is. Someone I'm sure many of you will know who's been very much involved in Yen from the beginning, and, uh, and I'm delighted to have here today, Professor Roger Sylvester Bradley. Roger, over to you. Thank you very much, Judith, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, really pleased to be able to take you through this event, and thank you to Judith and her team for organising it. Just explain what's going to happen. We, well, I'm going to give a short uh, introduction. We're then going to hear uh, how we decide on the winners of wheat, uh, for wheat quality. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to announce the, uh, the, our three winners. And then we're going to, the winners have been kind enough each to, in this um, uh, uh, difficult year for meeting each other, they're uh, going to introduce us to their farms via three videos and then we're going to meet them in the flesh and we're going to have a panel discussion hopefully that'll start after about 40 minutes and we'll so we'll have about 20 minutes um uh, 20 minutes of opportunity to ask questions so please keep the questions coming um just in case you uh, next slide please uh, Amanda, thank you very much. The, just in case you don't know about the yen, and there may be one or two people who don't, uh, the yen is, uh, it began about eight years ago. It's a, um, uh, it stands for the Yield Enhancement Network, but in fact now it, it, it's generally about enhancing crop performance. And uh, I was involved in setting it up and, and uh, it's really uh, very rewarding to see how it's growing. And it's an open network, open to anyone or any organization who's interested in enhancing crop performance. But we rely hugely on the, our sponsors. So they're all on this slide here. Um, they, they are not just, uh, cash sponsor pay people who just give us some money to keep it running which we obviously need but they they're also heavily involved in telling us in advising us on how to develop the yen how to manage the yen and they support yen entrance both physically by helping take measurements or maybe by uh, providing free data weather data analytical data and so on so our uh, sponsors are very much uh we're very much dependent on them and and so and you you can see the breadth of uh sponsorship the hdb of course is one of them uk flour mill millers is another but we've got lots of them right across the industry so it's a truly cross-industry self-help network uh aiming to try and enhance crop performance so um what I'd like to do now is uh, go straight to 
uh, to Joe Brennan. Joe Brennan is going to explain how we've decided who the winners are. Uh, so just to introduce Joe, uh, he is Senior Technical Advisor with UK Flour Millers, uh, which is the trade association that represents virtually all UK flour milling industry, um, and it sponsors the N Week Quality Awards. Um, Joe's job is to cover a wide range of technical issues for the sector, including um, not just the ENS, but food safety and variety assessment. So over to you, Joe. Great. Thank you, Roger. Um, I, hope, I hope I'm coming through loud and clear on the headset. Um, <clears throat> you may have known uh, UK Flower Millers previously uh, as NABIM, but um, we, we've, we've got a new name, which I hope is more self-explanatory, as we are the trade association for the uh, UK milling industry. Um, we, as an industry, we sponsor the Yen uh, Wheat Quality Competition, um, which looks to recognise growers uh, who achieve both high yields and quality. Um, and we also carry out the, the quality testing and judging for the competition. So I'll just give you a quick uh, run through of the competition selection process, um, the, the sifting and quality testing criteria, um, so that you can see how we select the finalists and, and ultimately the winners. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Amanda? Um, so, so starting with the beginning from competition entry, if you're already set up within the wheat yen, it, it's very easy to enter the quality competition. Your entry needs to meet the criteria of being a, a group one wheat variety with, with a verified grain yield, and you need at least five kilos of sample retained. Um, this year, we, we've had slightly fewer entries than, than previously, um, which isn't particularly surprising given how, how dire the conditions were across a, a swathe of the country and the number of growers who, who struggled to get wheat in the ground. Um, of the of the 23 eligible entries we, we saw for 2020, um, three had to be excluded as they didn't have enough sample retained to proceed. In terms of the, the varietal split that we see, not really much surprising in there uh, when we consider the composition of group one varieties that are, are currently favoured by growers. Uh, but in previous years, we've seen a bit of Trinity and Illustrious in the mix as well. Could I have the next slide, please, Amanda? Um, so the, the eligible entries have to provide uh, grain quality data uh, and, and we sift on this basis to determine those uh, who will proceed further in the competition. Um, this year, the minimum requirements were 12.5% protein, 76 uh, kilo specific weight and 250 second Hagberg, uh, as well as a minimum of nine ton per hectare yield. In, in a more typical year, we'd use a 13% protein cutoff, uh, but as this was a lower protein year, we adjusted this down to 12.5%. To Next slide, please, Amanda. In terms of the, the quality of the entries this year, um, it was good, but with none falling short of the uh, specific weight or Hagberg requirement. But as I just said, it, it was a lower protein year um, and also a relatively low yielding year, as, I, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Of the 20 eligible entries, uh, four had lower than 12.5% protein uh, and six had less than nine tonne per hectare yield, which actually rather conveniently left us with 10 remaining entries, which, which is the number we, we uh, would take forward in, in any year as final quality testing. In years where we have more than 10 entries, once that sifting's done, um, we sort the remainders by by protein yield and, and the 10 with the highest protein yield proceed to the final stage. Um, we use protein yield as, as a, a good measure of, of both yield and quality combined. Can I have the next slide, please, Amanda? So we've got our, our 10 entries now to take forward for the final quality testing. So the, the five kilo sample buckets that yen entrants get uh, those are all sent to a, a UK flour millers member uh, milling and baking laboratory. Um, the first thing those folks will do is, is check for contamination. I mean, this is still a food uh, laboratory and there, and there are safety and hygiene protocols that have to be followed. Uh, a sample this year actually had to be ejected. Um, it, it got through the original sifting, but it was found to be contaminated with animal faecal matter. And, the, the technician who is apparently somewhat of an amateur zoologist could actually tell it was polecat feces, which seems remarkable. Uh, it seems like a bit of a non secretaire I'm taking you on then, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that it, it doesn't matter if you produce a fantastic crop, if the, if the food safety is compromised, you can't sell that into the food market for obvious reasons. 
But back to the quality testing, um, the, the meal lab, will, they'll carry out a grain quality analysis, looking at the, the standard attributes, but also characteristics such as grain hardness. That's, that's pretty much par for the course when it comes to a mill lab doing um, further milling and baking analyses, as they want to get their own understanding of the characteristics of the grain and take that forward. Pilot milling is carried out, which is just milling the grain on a very small scale to produce a white flour. That flour is then tested for water absorption, and that's a, from a miller's perspective, that's a key quality characteristic. Um, and then the dough is tested to analyze the properties of the gluten. Lastly, we bake that dough to a, to a standard industry recipe and the loaves are assessed. Uh, next slide, please, Amanda. <clears throat> so we put together all those results to, to produce this table and, and you, you can start to pick apart the kind of seasonal trends as well as look at the, the differences between the individual entrants at this point. So across all the samples, we see uh, a lower flower water absorption and that's, that's an undesirable trait, but, but a feature of the 2020 crop and likely linked to the, the lower protein levels. But despite these lower protein levels, uh, the gluten quality was good, even in those wheats with a, with a lower level. Um, when it comes to bread making wheat, what we're looking for is a gluten that's both elastic and extensible. And those figures need to be in relative alignment to get the right performance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the gluten quality information is key, but you really need to carry out a bake to get a true understanding of that wheat's uh, overall quality. Um, the baking method we use is an industry standard Chorleywood bake. Um, it's given 800 gram loaf, and that's a kind of small scale version of what, we, what would be done in, in a typical um, industrial bakery in the UK. Uh, we, we assess the loaf volume and its color. Uh, and, and the color texture and structure of, of the loaf breadcrumb. And we're looking for a couple of things. I mean, we want a, a large loaf volume, too, too small, and you've, you've probably got an issue with your gluten. Uh, we're also after a white breadcrumb. Bread crumb. Yellow or gray uh, certainly want to be avoided. And, and unlike in other countries, you, you can't add bleaching agents to flour in the UK. And, and so you need to rely on the, the, the intrinsic color of the wheat and endosperm. Uh, we're also looking for a fine and resilient breadcrumb. Um, it needs to look visually appealing and be soft, but also not crumble under pressure. Next slide, please, Amanda. So the winners, um, as I said before, the, the competition is about recognizing growers who, who achieve high yields without compromising on quality. So we take a sort of holistic view of these features, comparing quality across the, the wheat, flour, dough and baking tests. Uh, this year wasn't as difficult as others in that respect, as, as the three top yielding entries also showed some of the best milling and baking quality. Um, the harder part was was really determining the final ranking of those top three. Um, the the bronze award winner had the the highest yield and the second highest protein yield, and the milling lab results showed good grain quality, but a, but a slightly lower protein. And whilst the loaf quality was very good, there was lower flour water absorption, which was likely a result of the, the slightly lower protein. And this held the entry back relative to the other two. Um, water absorption, it's a key quality feature from a miller's perspective, and we want it to be high. I mean, it, it means you can use less flour to produce the same loaf size. The, the silver award also had a good yield and protein yield. We saw some great grain quality and, and ultimately an excellent bake with the only feature holding it back being some slight coarseness in the texture of the breadcrumb. The, the gold award winner had the, the second highest yield but the highest protein yield at 1.3 tons per hectare. And in conjunction with this high protein yield, the, the flour and gluten quality was excellent as well as the baking quality with the only flaw being a slight weakness in its crumb structure. Um, and, that, and that combination of yield and quality across all tests meant that that was the standout winner this year. Uh, next slide, please, Amanda. This is a comparison, uh, a visual comparison of, of a loaf that was seen to have excellent quality against one that had relatively poor quality. Uh, and you might be looking at this slide and thinking it's hard to see a difference um, and you're not particularly wrong. I mean, it's hard to convey these differences with, with just photos. You, should, you certainly wouldn't be able to judge uh, differences on the basis of photos only. And understanding what makes a good bake, what makes a poor bake is about the, the feel and texture and structure of the loaf. In previous years, we, we've had the loaves at the Milling Week Conference for attendees to sort of prod, squeeze and compare uh, for obvious reasons that that's not happening this year. 
um, but I hope by February 2022 uh, you'll all be able to see the next set of loaves in person. Thank you very much. That's me done. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, uh, very good. Um, Joe is going to stay with us for the rest of the webinar. And so uh, please, if you have any questions, because uh, there was a lot of technical information there, and I'm sure you must, you don't understand it all. So I'm sure you've got questions for Joe. Please keep them coming. And, um, and uh, well, if you've got questions about anything as we go on through the webinar, please keep them coming because the panel discussion won't work unless we've got your questions. So thank you very much to Joe. And the next slide, Amanda. So it's now my pleasure. In fact, in eight years of being involved in the end, this is the first time I've ever had to do this job, uh, which is to announce uh, some awards. And so, you know, we've got three award winners. You've seen their lows, and we're now going to put the faces to uh, of the growers of those uh, samples uh, to, to the lows. So uh, the next slide, Amanda. So our first, uh, my first announcement is of our bronze award winner for wheat quality, which goes to Amanda. James Loder Simmons, who uh, is from Nonington Farms, uh, which is in Eastern Kent. Um, this was James's third entry into the yen. Um, James is uh, the Nonington Farms is uh, 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 recently announced that it was a, became coming a leaf demonstration farm. Um, Ten percent of all their land is in stewardship, uh, and all their wheat is either it is uh, the, uh, uh, milling wheat, I think, um, but certainly they're big milling wheat growers. It represents more than half of their crop land. So well done to James. Many congratulations. Uh, the next slide, Amanda, please. So the silver award winner um, is Amanda, also called James. It's James Mays, who uh, is in from Bentfield Berry Farms in Essex, which is between Stansted and Bishop Stortford. Um, James, uh, and in fact, uh, James is part of a century farming group, which is who are all members of the Yen and sponsored by Bayer. So uh, we're very pleased that James is a winner. And um, James uh, well, has had a role within the Century Farm Group of developing their agronomic policy. And I had the pleasure of meeting with James and his colleagues in, Century, in the Century Group yesterday. So uh, James is a longstanding member of the Yen, entrant in the Yen, and um, many congratulations, James. Um, I'm sure it'll uh, support your role in leading your century group. So uh, the next slide, please, Amanda. So the gold award goes to Amanda Simon Budden, who is from Netherley Farm, Southeast Hampshire. Um, Simon's just told me this is the, the first time he's actually uh, entered in the end. So first time lucky, or perhaps first time to show his his skill and determination. Very good. Um, thank you very much for those videos. And um, I think we may have some connection problems, but hopefully all three of our winners can energize their webcams and their microphones now so that we can start our panel discussion. James, it's good. We're going to call, we, because we have two Jameses, we're going to call them James M and James LS. And it's good to see James LS because he just sent us a message saying his internet went down. But um, so thank you all three of you for your for your videos and your starring roles and um I, i'm hoping that we have uh, some pending questions because we don't have very many existing questions but um we'll start with the with the one question from uh, patrick bidwell which is um well i'll read it out it's uh, 
uh, well, I'll, I'll praise it because it's sort of, how do you balance, I think this is what it is, what is the consideration when looking at all over your crop performance of producing crops economically, uh, is there a consideration of how well the grain is marketed? So I think that's to do with, you know, if, well, it, I, can you interpret that better than me? Who wants to go first? James Mays. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, look here. It, it's we've looked at local markets, weather patterns, crop yield, and we have a policy we want to add value. We traditionally, had a lot of exportable feed wheat. Now moving into um, quality grain, and for us here, we've we've. We've grown crops at a very good rate and added some very useful value to them, and 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 it's been a real boost to the business. So, it's uh, yeah. Hopefully, that's a simple enough answer, Roger. Um, James Lord Simons. Um, we have actually, I think I may have said on the video clip, have um, started supplying. Um, one of the mills in the five-year sustainable wheat contract. Um, and because we're leaf mark accredited, we um, are hopefully opening doors to pursue the more sustainable um, markets. And with that, it means that in terms of the protein standard, we tend to be looking at 12 and a half now rather than 13, which from a carbon footprint point of view has a big, a big impact as well. Thank you, and Simon. Do you want to add um, anything? Well, <clears throat> we always try to grow for quality markets, though. We do a lot of seed production as well for, for all our spring crops. And the milling wheat group ones, we've always liked to grow those. Unfortunately, our local mills closed at Southampton now for a year and a half, I think it is. Um, but we're still managing to sort of ship it around places, so we're quite, um, quite happy. But uh, yes, I'd agree with the others really on that. <laughs> So, so it's a sort of, um, you're all saying that you're reasonably confident that you've got a market, so it's worth the extra investment. It's sort of, is that, is that right? For us, Roger, we've, we're not too far away from those mills heading into the Midlands, but in recent time, we've got, uh, we're not very far from Harlow. We've got a new mill has opened there from GR Wright. So we're only what would be would be less than 15 miles away. So that that has been a very welcome market that has opened for us and 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 presented some very good opportunities. I mean, um, the, a question I've always had with milling wheat growers is that when we look at the statistics, because the AHDB does a milling wheat quality survey. The chances of you actually getting the spec are actually pretty small. So, uh, and so it always seems to me going for the quality market is actually quite a risky strategy. If if you're if you feel that you're you know, incurring a yield, you know some some lower yield potential than if you were growing for the feed market. So. What would you say your chances of success are of actually getting the spec? I mean, James Lotus, you, you you said uh, you 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 know you've got this lower spec because it's your leaf mark and so on. But what would your chances have been before that? Um, to be honest, I think we we have always struggled to hit thirteen percent. Um, and with Zayat, as I said, you know, we've got the high yield with it, but we also grow Crusoe and Skyfall. And we, there is a sort of yield penalty for us growing um, Crusoe, but we know we can hit uh, the 13%. Also, with Crusoe, it has a very good nitrogen conversion rate into protein. So I think there is a balance, as you say, Roger, and probably to actually go for a, a variety with a lower yield so that you have a higher chance of hitting the protein standard, I would say. Okay. 
Do you have any failures? <laughs> I'd say it's research or trials in farming, isn't it? <laughs> You're always learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay well we'll go on to um we'll, we'll try another question from the uh from the floor so to speak um uh in the grain sample side i don't quite understand this can you tell the difference between a polio applied end to boost protein levels and just a higher end rate in early may or before ears are visible you think you can tell the difference so, what, what, Simon, can you start with that one? Do you use yeah. polio sprays? Yes, we use polio sprays. Um, and we generally, with Crusoe, over the last few years, we've been hitting the, the proteins quite well, slightly higher in some, some times. But um, the Zaya we're growing, we're, we're struggling with that to get the protein. And um, I don't know if I said in my thing, we put on uh 260 kilos of solid n and then 40 42 kilos of liquid um i think it was a sixth of june time so that worked really well this year um and it's we, we do that all the time really so this coming season with half of our wheat group ones are for seed and uh, so I'm going to try and um, experiment with the Zayat and see see what how low we can get away with and how high we might need to do with, with the um, with the use of the end tester, which has been brilliant, I think, for sort of identifying how how the program's gone throughout the season and has um, given us a lot of confidence. Yeah, James May, has any comments on the? <clears throat> Roger, we've, we're still relatively new milling wheat growers. Uh, we've only been in into the group one for three years now, but the whole time we've we've variably applied N right from the start of the season. We're using regular sort of NDVI imagery. We're looking to even up canopy uh, of, of the crop. We variably apply PGRs and fungicides. So right from the outset, we're trying to get that even canopy to increase our chances of hitting that 13% protein. So uh, prior to Harvest 20, we've hit the 13% with Folia N, but Harvest 20 was a very different matter. So we've never tried the granular application at that timing that you'd suggested. And it is one of those that you know, we, we sort of wrestle with that every year whether or not we should be trying that. But while we've had these results, it's, sort of, it's difficult for us to deviate away from something that's worked for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. James lotus Lemons, do you want to comment? All I would add to that is we're um, working hard with our soils to improve the residual nitrogen that's available at the beginning of the season. Um, and we're moving or have moved away from foliar urea on the air and more if we need to on the solid side environmentally um, with um, using urea but we're also trialing some more organic nitrogen feeds um, to see how we get on with that in terms of raising protein levels okay very interesting i i, I mean i'm very tempted to do lots of scientific comment from my experience with the two but i think i better act carry on acting as a chairman so um the next question great videos um, if we have another dry spring this year, um, what would the three winners do differently uh, to what you did last year? Simon, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> um, not a lot, really. I think we might be, we might uh, not worry about, well, we were worried about rust coming in later and it just didn't happen. Uh, the Crusoe stayed clean all the way through, um, so I think we would uh, we would probably look at fungicide spend and maybe growth regulator as well. And uh, but yeah, we're pretty careful with the timings of those. And uh, well, I don't think we'd change. I mean, I noticed that you applied your first N in March. You didn't do anything in April in February. Uh, no, we did. We did put some in February. Um, Sorry, I got that wrong. 
Yeah, we find it. it we, yes, we did. We did five splits of solid before we got yeah. to the yeah. liquid, so it's quite a lot. We, we were just chasing the weather, really. We had a lot of rain earlier on, so we just put a small amount on, and then we were worried about it turning dry, so we'd rush out and put a bit on. Yeah. So it meant two of our applications weren't the variable rate because we just couldn't get the files quick enough on the day we decided to, to put some yeah. on. So just small amounts all the time, basically. Yes. James Lode Simmons, you, you it was you that had three applications, the first in March, was it is that right? Um that is um correct. Yeah, we started had the first application on the 13th of March last year. I think yeah. the difference between last year and this year is that generally our crops are looking better they went into better conditions um so i would say i maintain tiller numbers from the word go um and disease control would probably be spending less because you only spend what you can see in front of you and if it's a dry spring apart from rust septoria levels will be low yeah james mays any comment or should we go on to the next I, one? No, I, I'd quickly echo everything that James has just said, Roger. We, yeah, last year we were late coming out of spring with early nitrogen. This year we've already got a dose on. And yeah, as the season unfolded last year, the fungicide spend possibly could have come under greater scrutiny. But again, that's being well, for us, that was being wise after the event. So it uh, yeah, that's where we're at. Okay, I mean, the, the next question, we've got lots of questions coming now, so we're, we're doing well. So, um, Rust is an issue with the present recommended list group one varieties. Do you find this an issue or is Rust still easy to manage? So, I'll, <coughs> James, Mays, you kick off and then. We know that our skyfall is susceptible to yellow rust here in the dry Dry yeast, yeah, always an issue. We're only on 500 mil of rain a year, uh, but we tailor our program. We're fully aware of what that variety is capable of doing, what its uh, sort of characteristics are. So our programs are designed around that. I'm quite, I'm always relatively re relaxed about yellow rust, Roger, in the fact that we can, we've got sufficient capacity within the spray, the spray of the system. I, we play, pay close attention to sort of water volumes when we make applications and we're monitoring the crop we, we, we make sure that we get back into it so I'm yeah I'm more relaxed about yellow rust but obviously sort of with the um with the withdrawal of, of one very effective fires uh where we go in the future it, yeah it could always change couldn't it so yeah Simon uh, yeah, I'd agree with James on that. Uh, we're quite relaxed about rust. It's a septoria for us is the big problem. So, yes. Yeah. Do you agree with that, James LS? Yeah, no, I totally agree. We, we're growing all three main Group 1 varieties and they all have their their uh, challenges. But Crusoe and Skyfall having, you know, rust is a weakness. But for us, as the other panellists have said, you know, it's very easy to get on top of. Um, Let's so uh, we've got a whole collection of questions now. Um, yeah, do, d does anyone actually wait until flag leaf emergence? Because the, the alternative, this sort of harks back to the question about foliar urea and whether you can tell the difference in an analysis of the grain when it's been had foliar urea. I mean, just to say, my from a research point of view, uh, that, you know, that there is a there is a worry that foliar urea is sort of painted onto the surface of the grain, so it's not really protein. We've clearly uh, scotched that idea. It's not, you know, the the grain is then closed in chaff. Therefore, the, the what what the urea does is build protein most definitely. And in fact, Sue Salmon way back in the 90s showed that it was it was useful protein in in the terms of extensibility and and um elasticity so it um 
I, I don't think there's a worry that, but there is an environmental worry which James Ellis was referring to because it goes into the air, you know, the, the unrecovered and it's not recovered very efficiently. It's only about 20 or 30 percent efficient foliar urea. So it, the rest tends to go into the atmosphere, not into so much into the water. Um, so, uh, yeah, so an alternative is to use granular at the end of May, sort of, you know, after the canopy is formed, but with plenty of time for it to rain and to get into the crop through the roots. So I just wonder whether any of you have considered that. Well, we're going to try that this year with the seed crops because it won't be so critical if we don't hit the protein. So I thought that would give me a good chance with a big wheat crop possibly coming out of the ground this year as well to um to test all those things so we can try 260 solid 280 solid and at, at those sort of timings um any a comment james ls in the main we've always used um solid nitrogen to try and hit our um protein and and i think you really bring us on to a debate of the crops that we're producing that we should in terms of milling wheat growers be incentivized to get, if we are growing crops under certain uh, procedures, um, um, and it's an environmental benefit, we, we do need to be rewarded for that. And I think that's quite, for me, it sort of underlines really as an industry where we need to head. Yeah. And if anybody listening didn't hear it, there was a very interesting presentation on Tuesday in the Tuesday webinar from Peter Shuri about the project that's uh, looked at the possibility of breeding varieties or selecting varieties with uh, lower protein, but nevertheless good baking quality. Uh, James M, any any comment? Um, you don't have to. I've got the questions. Um, Louise Imp is asking, how did James LS manage to reduce variable costs by 30%? Um, was it mainly fungicide savings? I'd say it's across the board. Um, first one being P and K. We didn't apply any P and K because uh, we're using cover crops and we're using organic manures. Um, and then the second thing being only using sprays as a last resort and using more um yeah, varietal characteristics and, and other sort of non-chemical forms um and we also feel that next sorry this year we're going to reduce it even further um and, and staying with you james this is a question from somebody with your own surname what are your plans for the future to grow more sustainable wheat reduce your carbon footprint and improve your soil health <laughs> yeah, spot on. <laughs> I couldn't say it better than myself. Yes. <laughs> um, but there is a general question. There is there is another question about soil health and your attitude to soil health. So, um, where is it? Uh, um, yes. How important is soil health, organic matter, for determining final N uptake? And grain protein. And what what's your feelings about soil health? I'll come away from James Ellis at the moment. I'll go to um, James Mays. Sure. It, it's everything, Roger. It, it, it build is the building block of everything that we want to achieve. So, yeah, our our husbandry of soil 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 health needs to be built. So, it's as we've learned working with you with the yen. Yeah healthier soil stronger plant more resilient crop and ultimately high yields and then that's that's produced in a hopefully a more sustainably environmentally friendly friendly way so it's yeah, we we need to farm well but but that, i mean it's ron granger's asking the question ron ron's uh uh from lima grant and he he's also a sponsor of the end so we know him well and um, he's used organic matter and soil health in the same phrase. And 
from a science point of view, I think that the industry would do well to see those two things perhaps not quite so intimately interrelated. Because I think in our discussion yesterday, James, we talked about organic matter levels that were quite variable but not necessarily with the same with the sort of expected nutrient responses so how do you just how do you differentiate between organic matter and soil health It's quite a tricky one to answer, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I shouldn't. Uh, Fine. Right. Have you got anything on that, or or, or James LS? Yeah, yeah go I, on. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's all about organic matter to soil health. That is one of the elements to it. I think it's as Simon was talking about when he was he's been direct drilling for many years and not moving the soil. I mean, there. Yeah, we could spend <laughs> a long time discussing the subject. But I, I think the soil you know, is one of our biggest assets and that it is a bank of nutrient. And this might be quite debatable, but there are phosphate levels, for example, depending what the pH is, that we can then tap into that resource, which without having to necessarily keep applying artificial inputs onto our soils. And it's, I think it's a, a greater understanding of, of these elements will help us sort of push the boundaries and move forward. Roger, we've certainly we're taking this straw off of our crop. We're returning residue. We're being less invasive with our tillage policy. And over the last five years, we are cultivating fields less often to get a comparable, if not better, crop. And my Harvest 21 crop has been direct drilled and looks as well as anything we've ever produced before and again when we look back at our participation in yen soil health reports every year and looking at sort of health factors such as co2 burst uh, soils look healthy from those reports so it feels that we're we're in the right direction of travel and if we're producing good high yielding quality crops then then we must be on the right lines with it I'd like to say as well, with the minimum cultivations we've been doing, the top of the soil structure is lovely. The organic matter is breaking down much better now as well. We're keeping everything on top. We're not incorporating it, which we only started doing about four or five years ago. We were just weren't ploughing. We're still doing quite a lot of deep cultivations. And it's yeah. just taking the traffic so well. Earthworms, good, good numbers and things. And it's just so much better and easier and cheaper too. Yeah. I mean, to me, soil health is the turnover of the organic matter more than the organic matter quantity. But but anyway, perhaps um, I, I better not uh, hog the floor. I'm the chairman, so uh, we've got uh, oh, we've got one for Joe Brennan. So we'll give you all three a break, and if we can bring Joe up, Joe, can you energize your Thank you, Joe. Um, so the industry relies on high protein wheat for bread making, which will now come to a cost uh, at a cost regarding imports. Should the industry be rewarding growers for high grain protein crops? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I think to a degree they already are because a lot of the a lot you know premium is paid on the basis of protein in, in many cases. Um, but yeah, I think it is, you know, recognised that it is difficult to hit the 13% spec on a lot of farms. Whether changes to regulation are going to affect that or not, I don't know. Um, and there's been a lot of debate recently about imports and, and what millers are, are using and what they can and can't use. Um, you know, lots of the North American and German high protein wheats we use uh are are essential regardless of the quality of the uk crop um year in year out and effectively the use of those uh grains in the grist enables um the use of of, of high and, and medium protein uk wheat uh some some millers are they do have contracts where um they they contract growers to to deliver um you know, homegrown higher protein wheats. I think it's some 
Hungarian or possibly German genetics in the grain there. And I, you know, and I'm sure that comes at a premium because there's probably a, a yield implication. Um, and so whether there are opportunities uh, from a, from the breeding perspective of of either improving the performance of those higher protein varieties in the UK or or delving deeper into the the protein quality and the gluten quality, so still at the sort of 12.5 to 13 percent band, but actually improving the strength of that gluten. You know, I think that's where the the opportunities in the future are going to lie when we consider the the potential restrictions on on end use coming up. Thank you very much, Joe. That's excellent. Um, any quick comments from from our growers on that? Because if not, quick, um, can I quickly come in? And a quick question to Joe: Is that in the future, do you think there will be a, an, a, um, an added premium in terms of improving the nutritional status of flour? For example, selenium and zinc are quite low in the varieties that we're growing at the moment. Can you, can you do you think um, breeders will be incentivized? to do that, to make improvements? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I can't see it uh, happening across the industry in one go, but certainly there will be some businesses that are looking at, at ways to distinguish themselves in the market. Um, you know, we, we as an industry at our one of our webinars, uh, uh, seminars had a, had a presentation a few years ago by um, some folks, uh, I believe at Rothamsted or the John Innes Institute who were looking at increasing the iron content of the endosperm so that white flour and white bread has a, has a better nutritional profile because you know often people will say oh you know we can whack loads of nutrients into the the, the bran and the um the wheat germ but ultimately people in the uk don't don't really eat that much wholemeal and brown bread um so you know that, that's an opportunity for innovation in the future um but i i, I would expect that to be something that that it, companies would explore on an individual basis and, and likely on a sort of contract basis rather than uh, something that's um, widespread across the industry. Well, uh, thank you very much, Joe. And uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time. So, uh, and we still have some questions. So um, I, I think we'll draw it to a close there. And, and can I thank all three of you, uh, our winners uh, for putting yourselves up there to to answer all these questions and thank you very much indeed for answering them so well and joe as well thank you very much for your contribution and also because you were part of the planning group thank you to you and all your colleagues and my colleagues so sarah clark deval patel amanda tomlinson and judy stafford who are all involved in organizing this and and um in fact, you're the only one, Joe, on this screen that uh, actually organized it. But anyway, um, so thank you very much. And I think if Amanda has got, uh, well, I, I've got one or two other thank yous to, to make before I hand back to Judith. And I also want to uh, highlight uh, a couple of forthcoming events, one of them tomorrow. So this is the, uh, United Oil Seeds AHDB online webinar about re-establishing oilseed rape as a key crop in the rotation, and that's tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and it will include the winners of uh, another yen competition, which we're calling the Establishment Beauty Contest. So this is the first Establishment Beauty Contest we've had for oilseed rape, and uh, if, you, if you're not registered already, you can go on to the yen website under events, and you can find your way through to uh, how to register for that and uh, Amanda the next just click for the next build so we uh, in a couple of weeks time and on Tuesday the 9th at four o'clock in the afternoon we have our first yen reporting workshop now Simon held up his report our reports are 24 pages long and they're not uh, eminently digestible i don't know whether uh, i won't ask simon what he thinks but um but they do take some digesting so we've decided to offer people the opportunity to meet with a, an adas physiologist in this new virtual world we live in online for a couple of hours to go through your report so if you uh, unfortunately we'll have to charge for this or you'll have to find sponsorship um, if you, you can register online again at our yen events page and uh, and uh, put in your yen entry reference numbers so we know 
uh, so we can look at the details of your crop before we discuss them and we're sort of imagining we get groups of people together to discuss their results but um, so thank you very much to everyone. Thank you particularly to UK Flower Millers for their sponsorship of this event. Thank you to the HDB for uh, sponsoring Yen and for running all three of these events this week. Uh, and I think lastly of all, thank you to all of you for listening, asking good questions. And if you'd like to join the, uh, to enter the Yen again for this year, uh, entry into all the different crop Yens is open already and you just have to go onto the website to do that so thank you very much and back to judith thanks roger um well that brings us nearly to the end of our first milling wheat week um just a few bits from me to finish off with as, as we always do um I, I do want to uh, thank all our speakers on behalf of ahdb um joe simon James and James, and, and also to our chair, uh, Roger, thank you very much. To everyone else, please can you complete the feedback survey, it will appear on your screen after the webinar ends. Um, and as I said earlier, a recording of the webinar will be sent to you and the slides will be made available online. Again, if you wish to collect your basis and roso points, um, please could you download the forms. That you'll, you can find at the side of your screen in the handout section and return it to the events email. We usually finish off by giving you a, um, a quick summary of what's coming next. Um, Roger's done the first bit for me, which is the um, seed rape conference tomorrow. Um, you can find information and the booking link on our events page on the website, so have a look. Um, Next week on Monday night, we'll have the latest in our series of Monday Monitor Farm uh, webinars, looking at tackling, this time, tackling suboptimal performance, that's lean management in practice. And one of our Monitor Farmers in the Southwest will be um, taking part in that. And then also next week, AHDB is running Carbon Week with a, as a series of webinars uh, running through the week. And again, details for that um, and booking links can be found on the events page of the AHDB website. And finally, uh, thank you for joining us.